We provide everything else. You use online enrollment. Over 300 videos of learning by the classes. And over 4,000 page library of student notebooks and textbooks for every student. All assessments, testing, grading, and performance. And we do all of this at no cost to your church, with no time commitment and busy pastors, and with classes that meet just one evening each week. We have fall and spring semesters, an exciting elective course. And the entire three years of Faith Life Institute costs less than just one class at the average Bible college. And tuition includes all textbooks, and it's even a 50% spouse discount. We want to help you revive your church and help you become more like Jesus Christ. All as part of our worldwide growing Faith Bible Institute family. And I hope to see you in class. All right, this is the program I've been in for almost two years now. Uh, the next semester starts in August. The sixth semester is actually in August. So if you're interested, you know, talk to me after church today. But we'll be starting at the, uh, st the sixth semester starts at the end of the Bible. So who's ever looked at a book and decided, I'm going to read the last chapter first, and then go look and <laughs> Eileen did not raise her hand voluntarily. <laughs> And then go start at the beginning and see how we got there. Um, so the tuition they mentioned is ninety dollars. Um, there's also a each each uh, semester there's a twenty five dollars student application fee. Um, you can pay it all at once or in um, payments throughout the semester. It's a word by word examination of the Bible from. He's, he's a Baptist preacher, and he started this in 1985. They are now international, and they're working on uh, new videos with translations into Spanish. Uh, it's pretty good. I'm really enjoying it. It's one of those things where you look forward to the next week's lessons opening up. Now, he mentions uh, one night a week, but the way I've been doing it, and it costs an extra $60 a semester, is all online, so you can watch the videos and, and do the study at, um, at your own pace. And one thing not to be scared about, I know Pastor Jeff is happy to hear this, there are no writing requirements. <laughs> I know Pastor Jeff's been writing a lot lately with his studies. So, again, just uh, meet me in the fellowship hall during uh, potluck, and if anybody's interested, we'll... We can talk more in depth about it. And there's some uh, brochures out on the front in the foyer that I printed out as well. I printed them out wrong, so one side's flipped upside down, but that's okay. All right. We ready to start singing? Please stand if you are able.
please be seated. Would the ushers come forward? Good morning, everybody. Thank you for all for being here. Uh, I just want to share with you something that every Saturday I go golfing with a pastor that I met in, while I was doing my discipleship in, in Aberdeen. And the word that he said to me is, is he, that he's focusing on right now is be ready. And, and we have the opportunity right here to share God's word, to, to, to lift our spirits, you know, and come together because we know who he is. And we have the opportunity to give right now because, unfortunately, it takes money to keep these lights on so that we can share. So at this time, I ask you guys to reach down, you know, and get what you can. And if you can't, so what? In Jesus' name, amen. amen. as the ush uh, ushers are putting the offering away. Go ahead and take a little bit of time to greet each other and uh, the children, young children, are excused at this time to Children's Church.
this thing picking me up? <laughs> you guys look like you like each other. It's good. It's good. So today I'm going to be continuing the series that I've started on in reach. Um, in reach is is you know working on ourselves. You know it's it's the we we often think about sharing the gospel with others, but we're sharing we're witnessing to a change that happens within us, right? So that's what inreach is focused on is is growing into the people that God is going to send us send out to the world. And so today, um, I, I know those of those of you in the in the military might recognize an acronym on the screen. Uh, we're going to be talking today about knowing our operating environment. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so if you guys didn't know, you guys know I'm in the Army. Uh, Narak's in the Army. Gerda's in the Army. Who, who else? We got... Oh, you're in the Army, too? Or are you in the... I'm oh, you're retired. Okay, yeah. Air Force. So we got Air Force in here, too. It's, it's, it's all the military. It's all the military. Well... What I'm what I'm here to tell you guys is that all of you, if you guys are in Christ, you're in the army. If, if that's if that's news to you, then uh, welcome. Uh, <laughs> but you're in the army, um, and not only are we in the army, God's army, we are currently deployed to a combat zone. We're under hostile fire all the time. Now, if you're not feeling that, there's a possibility that you're not a threat to our enemy. We're going to get into that. But we face a powerful enemy. We face a defeated enemy. But an enemy that still uses lies like he has since the beginning to trick, try to trick us out of believing in the promises that God has made to us. See, a, a lot of people are unaware of what they signed up for. And uh, I'm going to start, start out with a quote from a theologian named Arthur Pink, because he describes how evangelism, even back in his time, he, he died in, I think, the 1950s at the age of 66, um, he described how the way that the gospel is being shared with people is not conveying to them the kind of commitment that they are being asked to make. He says, the nature of Christ's salvation is woefully misrepresented by the present day evangelist. And I would say that present day still holds. He announces a savior from hell rather than a savior from sin. And that is why so many are fatally deceived. For there are multitudes who wish to escape the lake of fire, who have no desire to be delivered from their carnality and worldliness. So the title of this message, Know Your Operating Environment. Your operating environment is the location where you are serving, yes. But understanding it means knowing the threat level. Knowing what you're up against. Knowing where you are. Understanding what is appropriate behavior in, in, in your location and, and what's not. Knowing how you should be postured and how you shouldn't be. In special operations units, knowing your operating environment is an individual responsibility. It's the first rule of big boy rules. So big boy rules offers kind of a more relaxed uh, lifestyle than most conventional units that can ever enjoy or imagine. Uh, it's definitely not what you think about when you think about the Army. 
or the military in general. Big boy rules means you don't get micromanaged like a small child, which is the standard practice in most line units. Well, the Christian soldier is really more like a special operator. See, just like special operators answer to the highest echelons of government, um, they, they handle the, 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 the top priority missions straight from the top. That's, we answer to the king of kings. We partner with him in carrying out his unthwartable purpose. And so we would expect similar leeway as big boy rules offers. We call it Christian freedom. But with that freedom comes the responsibility to know our operating environment and not become complacent. We have to prepare ourselves to carry out God's orders and to resist the devil who we face along the way. In another one of his uh, books, Pink says, the Christian is engaged in a warfare. There is a fight before him. Hence, armor is urgently needed. It is impossible for us to stand against the wiles of the devil unless we avail ourselves of the provisions which God has made for enabling us to stand. This was his commentary on Ephesians chapter 6, which we're going to be going over in some detail today. The scope of awakening that this reality calls for is what has traditionally been called revival. Christians often pray for a revival. We say we want a revival in this country. We want a revival in our community. But we remain resistant to God's efforts to bring about revival in our self. And it's rather audacious for a church to ask God for a revival in their community without first reviving the church. See, as a church, we have to adopt the same mindset that a civilian adopts when leaving the civilian life behind to go join active duty military. When I, was, when I joined the Army back in 2006, I know my parents probably remember this really well, I packed light. I packed light. I think I only took the civilian clothes I was wearing and, you know, a few other things. There, there wasn't much. I think I brought a phone. Now, I, I needed a lot of things when I was home. I needed my clothes, right? I needed the place that I was staying, but I was going to the Army. And in the Army, I was relying on the Army to feed me. I was relying on the Army to clothe me, literally, <laughs> and to house me. And you know, they did. But they did more than that. They trained me. They trained me to face an enemy that was dedicated to my destruction. And not just my destruction, the destruction of the people who I was standing in the way for. There are people, our children, other believers who haven't had this awakening yet, who we need to stand in the way for. The military really is analogous to the life of the believer. Jesus offers the promise intended to comfort anyone consumed by anxiety over clothing and food, saying, therefore do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the Gentiles, that's the unbelievers, they seek after all these things. But your heavenly Father, he knows that you need them. He knows you, these, these are not superfluous things. Uh, these, are, these are needs. They rank up there on the hierarchy of needs. But then he says, but seek first the kingdom of God 
and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. This is God promising that we will never go unprovided for in our service to his kingdom. It's not a guarantee of wealth and prosperity. But it, it's not a promise also that we will never face trials or go without sometimes. The Apostle Paul wrote that he can, he, he's learned to go with plenty and he's learned to go with little. And he says, I can do all these things through Christ who gives me strength. Right? But we are serving God and we are learning to trust him that no matter what, if, in, in, if we are called according to his purpose, he's working all things for our good. He's, he, he's providing for us. Yes, we are gonna, we're going to face warfare when we, are, um, when we become a threat. <laughs> you know, the army provided my food and clothing, and they prepared me to face an enemy devoted to my destruction. They never guaranteed my safety. They trained me. They equipped me. And likewise, while God is promising to feed and clothe you, to provide for your basic needs, trusting in Him and learning His truths is going to prepare you to face the enemy that is dedicated to your destruction through lies and deceit. God's equipment for us is an armor. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. It's easy to get mad at people. People are pawns in a grander war between good and evil. And when we are not on the side of righteousness, we can be used in that way to hurt people with our words, hurt people with our behavior. We need to be aware that when people hurt us, when people speak evil of us, they too are just being used as pawns. They're not the real enemy. They're not the one making the moves. In terms of warfare, Christ's death and resurrection was the ultimate flanking maneuver. See, since the beginning, Satan had been able to use death to take out everyone that he hated. Death was his ultimate weapon, but when it came to Christ, this was the first time that he had used it on someone who hadn't sinned. See, Scripture tells us the wages of sin is death. Everyone who had sinned deserved to die. Christ was the first person to die who didn't deserve to die. And I don't think Satan was counting on the consequences of using his weapon against an innocent person. He was taking a victory lap and planning his parade when Christ walked out of the grave. Now, imagine the stunned defeat that he realized in that time. Now, when we find our salvation in Jesus, 
we become enemies of that, that ancient foe. And although he was defeated tactically in that, in that act, he continues to work against us. He, he uses lies like he has since the beginning. And with such a powerful enemy facing you, complacency is deadly. Jesus warns that all nations will hate you because you are my followers, but everyone who endures to the end will be saved. If you're in Christ, you have enemies. If you're walking with God, devoting yourself to growing in righteousness, Satan wants to trip you up. He wants to make you stumble. But here's the thing. He's only going to expend effort if it's strategically necessary. The most successful employed strategy is to simply allow your own complacency to take you into a state of a false sense of security and let you destroy yourself. That takes no effort on his part. Napoleon Bonaparte was quoted as saying, never interrupt your enemy while he is making a mistake. See, Satan figured that out a long time ago. Satan is strategic. He has to be. He's not omnipresent. He's not omnipotent. He has limited resources. He's outmanned two to one. If you're making a mistake that is leading to your death anyway, he's not going to interrupt you. He won't come after you if you are already on the broad road that leads to destruction. Satan is not going to devote any of his demonic resources to you. Your sin will kill you soon enough. He doesn't bother attacking people who are already killing themselves. On the other hand, if you are growing in faith and sharing your faith, in other words, obeying the Great Commission, then, friend, you have a great big target on your back. If you obey Jesus, you become a high-profile, high-priority strategic target for the enemy of your soul. And he will attack you wherever you're weakest. Is there a particular sinful desire that you have a particular proclivity for? I think we all do. They're called besetting sins. He will use the shame of that to isolate you from those who would keep you on the narrow path. If those that want to keep you on the narrow path are kept away from you, he can convince you even to ignore the Holy Spirit. And then it's just a matter of time before your flesh takes back over and leads you into sin. To protect yourself, God has given us armor. Literal armor. Spiritual armor. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you will be able to withstand. Able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand firm. The armor is there to protect you from the devil's schemes and his tricks and his lies. <coughs> Let's take a look at each piece. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the bless breastplate of righteousness. are out of order. <laughs> Give me a second. There it is.
There we go. Believing in something true keeps you from getting caught with your pants down. That's what a belt does, right? Keeps your pants up. Then we have the breastplate, the piece that protects our heart and other vital organs, which is righteousness. Righteousness comes from being in Christ, the righteous one, and his righteousness manifests in our own behavior as we learn to walk in the perpetual influence of the Holy Spirit. And as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. The gospel is peace between us and our creator. But it is also the message of peace to all who hear it, among all who hear it. The gospel brings people into unity who have nothing else in common. We desire for life, we desire life for those struggling in sin, we come in peace to present the news of Christ crucified to those in the world. Now, unlike some religious groups, we are never called to use violence to spread our message. It is truly a message of peace. It is exclusive, but it is peaceful. And that gives us a good standing against anyone who might speak against us. goes on, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Now, faith is not a strong feeling or desire for some outcome. That's often how it's misconstrued. Faith is defined in scripture as the substance of things hoped for. Faith, then, is the present-day placeholder for a future event. If the event that we are hoping for is something that God has promised to do, then our faith is rooted in the unchanging character of God. There is no surer thing than a promise of God. The flaming darts of the evil one are the lies that he tries to convince you to believe over the promises of God. And that's why we need to stay in the scripture. That's why we need to know it, think about it, meditate on it, let it be absorbed into every facet of our life. Because otherwise, any place where the word isn't is a place that the enemy can convince you to believe a lie. That's why it's so important to stay in the Word. Daily reading is the best way to keep the truths from being replaced by lies. And finally, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Our head is protected by the helmet of our adoption as sons and daughters into the family of God. Our identity in Christ our identity as actual adopted children of the Most High protects us from any, any lie of, the, of Satan that we are unworthy or that we, because we don't measure up in some way, that we're, we're, we're falling short. Our identity as children of God supersedes the attempts of Satan to convince us that we're not worthy that we're not worthy of such an honor, even after Jesus declared it. The word of God is many times described as a sword. It is sharper than a double-edged sword. John describes Christ as having a sword coming out of his mouth in Revelation. This sword represents his words as God's word. The words come out of his mouth, God's word, the sword. And they cut through the lies. They cut through the conflations and the, and the obfuscations. 
Those are fun words, right? Knowing God's word, just as Jesus demonstrated during his temptation by Satan, is the key in overcoming Satan's misrepresentations and twistings of the truth. But finally, we get to praying at all times in the Spirit. With all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Like soldiers in combat, God tells us to call up every movement, every observation, every request for supply, every call for air support. As believers, our communication with God must be constant during our battles. Because it is, in fact, God that is fighting our battles for us if we are in Christ. As believers, <laughs> in, the, in our time of battles, that's when we need air support the most. <laughs> but notice also that we need to pray for each other. That's who the saints are here. They're not the people who have, you know, statues of them carved. It's us. We're praying for each other. We are the saints. Such prayer calls for perseverance. It's easy to get kind of bored or busy or distracted, and yet it's our most important weapon in the Spirit. Well, right up there with the sword of the Spirit. It will be a slog at times. If, but if it wasn't important, it wouldn't be part of our armor. Now, no one said that this life would be easy. Jesus promised it would be hard. This is the hard road, the road less traveled. If we are where we're supposed to be, we will face persecution and vitriol and temptations. <coughs> Satan will throw the kitchen sink at us to keep us from carrying on with Christ's mission. You don't receive flack unless you're over the target. Jim, the picture up on the screen is of planes flying over a target and getting anti-aircraft right. shot at them. They're Jesus' planes, Jim. They're never going to make it. <laughs> but keeping this mindset, this military mindset, like giving up your civilian life, taking on the mindset that you don't need any of that stuff that you sought after before. God's taking care of you. You're going into a, a, a you know, going into active duty is a completely different mindset from civilian life, even from reserve life completely different and that's but that's the kind of change that we're called to make from the old life to the new life the more we try to stay stay unchanged the the less we're going to experience the transformation that we're called to experience and besides that the devil will attack you only when you're doing God's work If he isn't attacking you, ask yourself if you are being obedient to what God has called you to do. Now, God has given us grace to get back up if we have stumbled. But we don't take, don't take up residence in a place of ease. If you get into that sin management cycle where you're just going from sin to sin, that, that's, that's a place where Satan is going to just let you stay and suffer. Climbing out of that requires a hand up from another fellow believer. 
call them battle buddies in the army. So if sin is a regular part of your life, you're not being a faithful witness to the transforming power of God. And Satan will leave you alone there. But don't stay there. Get back in the fight. The battle against sin is a lifelong fight to the death. But we're not alone, and we're called to victory, and ultimately to bear witness to God. As Keith wrote in that song that we sang earlier, he feels an urgency to share God's word far and wide. I want to take your word and shine it all around. Then he says, but first, let me just live it, Lord. He, he says that with such anguish. That's the inreach. That's the part where we take the gospel and apply it to ourselves. Experience the change that we know is possible. And then go tell people how it changed us. We don't have to convince them that the Bible is true. There, there's, there's, there's plenty of evidence that it is, but that's, we're, we're called to share our witness, not to convince people intellectually of a truth. You can believe a truth and, and have it not affect your behavior one bit. That's, that's not where we're called to be. You can believe all the right things, but if it's not having an effect on your behavior that is making you more like Christ, then you're not there. It's only by learning and applying God's word to our lives that we can become the faithful witnesses that Christ has called us to be to serve his mission, to seek and to save the lost. Now, if, you, if this was something you just realized about the nature of your salvation, if you were somebody that, that initially accepted that salva salvation from hell and, and hadn't, hadn't gotten around to the, the salvation from sin part, well, if, if that's something you still desire, welcome. Um, but you're overdue to report for basic training. Yes. And after that, you'll need to go learn your MOS. That's, <laughs> that's a military <laughs> occupational specialty for those yes. who are not in the know. But that's our spiritual gifting. That's our spiritual gifting. And we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. Right, Pastor Tim? Well, we all fall somewhere along that in our journey. And we need to know where, what our operating environment is. We need to know who we're fighting and why we're not receiving flack if we think we should be. And I think we also need to be reminded that even though we live in relative comfort here in America, that there are believers around the world who face persecution every day for their faith. Those are the, some of the saints we need to be praying for. Acquaint yourself with their stories and lift them up in prayer because they need our prayers. And it, it helps to keep us reminded of the reality of the war that we're, we're engaged in when we see others you know taking hostile fire yeah maybe we haven't been hit yet but our time is coming our time is coming we need to be prepared when that time comes if you will pray with me Heavenly Father I pray that you will speak to anyone who needed to hear or that you have spoken to, to anyone who needed to hear this message today that they can be aware and shake off the complacency of the 
the ruts of Christianity as, as a religion and seek after a close walk with you, with the Spirit, that they can stand strong in the day of battle that is coming and is, is actually upon us in the Spirit. And Lord, strengthen your believers here. Help us to draw encouragement from your word, draw encouragement from the successes of other believers in the face of the challenges and the temptations that we all face on a daily basis. Continue to lead us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand and join us for our final song, if you're able. Boy, this song really fit into what you were talking about, didn't it? <laughs> Woo! That was you. I love to tell the story. Tell the story will be my theme in glory to tell the old old story of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story, tis pleasant to repeat when seems each time I tell it.
was reminded as I sat down before the sermon that I forgot to pray us in this morning. <laughs> so let me take that opportunity and bless the food for Let's do that. fellowship afterwards. Heavenly Father, thank you to, for today's message and, and ask that you settle it on our hearts this morning and, and bless those as we go together into the world to share your love and your truth. We'd ask that you would bless our fellowship this afternoon, bless the food that we're about to receive, and especially bless the hands that prepared it and provided it for us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.